Well, thank you very much for your kind welcome. It's a pleasure and a privilege for me to be here with you today. Uh, I've been struck by how warm-hearted uh, the people I've met so far are. Uh, every time I come to the USA, and I think my 65th visit, I think, um, I'm always struck by the kind-heartedness of the Americans that I meet. You're not a perfect people, in case you thought you were, <laughs> but you are a warm-hearted, generous-hearted nation. And the Christian believers I've met uh, have uniformly, over 30 years, been extraordinarily kind and generous to me. Uh, I think I've only met one wacko in, uh, <laughs> he was really off the wall, he, he was on another planet. Um, but apart from him, uh, I've only experienced uh, kindness and generosity. Well, in the four addresses that we will be pondering together today, we'll be thinking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But let me begin with a, a caveat. There is always the danger when we think of the Spirit or the Son or the Father that we do so atomistically. We think of the Holy Spirit and we do well to think more of the Holy Spirit than we do in the church today. But when we think of the Holy Spirit, we should always be thinking of the Spirit as the Spirit who belongs to the Godhead. He does not act independently of the Father and the Son. He does not act atomistically. He acts in holy communion with and in holy harmony with the Father and the Son. And so when we, we think about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we should always do so within the context of the Holy Trinity. Just as the Lord Jesus could say, I do nothing of myself, so the Holy Spirit could equally say, I do nothing of myself. What the Spirit does, the Father and the Son do. And it's very important that we think of the three persons of the Godhead integrally and communionly in concert one with the other. Even when we think of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, it wasn't the Father who was crucified for our sins. We're not Patripassians, are we? It wasn't the Holy Spirit who was put to death, the just for the unjust to bring us to God. It was the Son. But the Son was there at the behest of the Father, and He was there upheld by the Holy Spirit. It was by the eternal Spirit, says the writer to the Hebrews, by the eternal Spirit that He offered Himself unblemished to God. The Holy Trinity is always involved in everything that the Holy Trinity does. Often it's the Father who is to the fore. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And it is only begotten, not one and only. And it is the Son who loved us and who gave Himself for us. And it's the Spirit who, who comes from the Father and the Son to bring us into union with Christ and into communion with the Godhead we should increasingly be asking to think and worship and witness as Trinitarian Christians. The Holy Trinity always acts in holy concert one with the other. And so while in these four addresses we'll be thinking particularly about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we should always be keeping in mind it is a ministry that is operative 
in communion with the Father and the Son. And the other caveat that I would mention right at the outset is this. It's often said that the Holy Spirit is the forgotten person in the Godhead. And sadly, that's an accusation that has been directed towards uh, Reformed or Conservative Christians. And I think, sadly, too often, um, they've been correct. We have not given the Holy Spirit the, the prominence that the Holy Scriptures give to the Holy Spirit. And that will be the focus of my final address, the Holy Spirit uh, his ministry in, in the life, the holy humanity of our Savior, Jesus Christ. But having said that, we need always to keep in mind that those who most honor the Spirit are those who most glorify the Son. He will bring glory to me. I lived for 17 years in Cambridge, great university city, uh, the southeast of England, and one of the glories of Cambridge is King's College. It's a magnificent building built over 120 years uh, from about um, 1400 to 1510, 1520. It's a magnificent building. And if you were to pass King's College at night when it's dark, it's illuminated by a myriad of floodlights. And the floodlights shine and uh, show forth the magnificence of the architecture. It really is a breathtaking sight. And when you're passing through uh, the King's Quadrangle, you're not looking down at the floodlamps thinking, my, aren't they beautifully arranged? Aren't they magnificently situated? The floodlamps are saying, don't be so foolish. Look away to where I'm shining. And that's the great ministry of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes he is called the self-effacing person of the Godhead. I'm not so sure I like that, but it makes the point. He will bring glory to me. The Spirit is most honored when the Savior is most glorified. When I was thinking about what I might speak on at this conference, uh, I was drawn to thinking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And it might seem a little strange, perhaps, unexpected, that we should begin this morning looking at the Holy Spirit and the Christian, the Spirit's ministry of regeneration. I say it might be strange because what's more basic than regeneration? It's Christianity 101, isn't it? The Christian life begins when the Spirit of God comes in the power of God and in the grace of Jesus Christ to plant new life within us. Nothing is more basic, nothing is more fundamental, nothing is more foundational to understanding what a Christian actually is by the sovereign power of God through the ministry of the Spirit of Christ. He comes and He plants the seed of God within our lives. But I've been a Christian long enough and been a pastor long enough and now a theological teacher long enough to realize that we always need at times to go back to basics. We can never be reminded too often that the Son of God loved me and gave Himself for me. We never graduate beyond the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is with the work of the Holy Spirit. And in this first address, I want simply to focus on a truth that perhaps all of you, maybe not all of you, but perhaps even most of you know well. But we can become overly familiar with truth. We can become so 
mindful of how significant truths are that we actually don't pause long enough to savor the wonder of them and to experience afresh the grace and the glory of them. We can forget only too easily how deeply mired in sin we were until God gloriously and sovereignly by His Son, through His Spirit, came to us in our lostness, lifted us up out of the miry clay, and set our feet upon a rock. So, this morning in our first address, I want to reflect with you on this most basic and essential truth that lies at the very heart of the Christian faith, the necessity of the new birth. When the gospel is preached, when the glad tidings of Jesus Christ as Savior, Lord, King, Prophet, and Priest is proclaimed, when God personally pleads with sinners and calls us to turn from our sin and rebellion and come to Him for pardon and new life, we are faced with a profound problem, aren't we? How can people who are dead in trespasses and sins respond to God's gospel call? How can people who are dead make themselves alive? Is it not utterly incongruous to think that there can be any rationality in the call of God to repentance and faith when that call is addressed to men and women and boys and girls who are dead, not lingeringly dying, but who are dead in trespasses and sins. But that profound problem has an answer to it. And the answer is simply this, what we are incapable of doing, God does. Blessed be His name. The gracious, powerful, renovating, sovereign ministry of the Holy Spirit is placarded to us, not just as we'll see in the third chapter of John's Gospel, but from the very beginning of Holy Scripture. The new birth is not a new covenant phenomenon. It's a truth that is embedded in the very fabric and heart of redemptive history. The point of origin in every Christian believer's life, notice this language, the point of origin in every Christian believer's life is God's eternal decree to save a people to the praise of His glory. That's the point of origin. But the point of origin in history is the sovereign work of God, the Holy Spirit, implanting within us new life from above. The Bible is passionately monergistic and not synergistic. We do not ally ourselves with God in creating new life within us. We don't join hands with the Most High so that new life can come to us by His own sovereign good pleasure, according to His own eternal decree. God acts monergistically to do what we could never do for ourselves. It's the Holy Spirit who enables us both to hear God's gospel call and to respond to it in repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, let me pause for a moment just to make this broader point. When you read John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, and don't be off put at all by the name Calvin. Calvin is a beautifully lucid prose writer. Along with Blaise Pascal, he was one of the formative originators of modern French prose. Calvin writes beautifully. John Owen writes never, rarely beautifully. <laughs> Owen writes English as you would write Latin. His English is Latinate. It's full of long, coordinate sentences. You get into the rhythm of Owen. Don't be put off with Owen. Owen is magisterial. Calvin's heavenly, but Owen is magisterial. <laughs> and Calvin uses the word regeneration not to speak about that momentous moment when the Spirit of God plants new life within us. Calvin uses the word in a broader sense to refer to the total transformation of the sinner into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So, he's, he's using it in, in a broad sense. It's, it's only later in the 16th century into the 17th century that, that regeneration comes to be more specifically related to and identified with that momentous moment when the Spirit of God comes and gives us new eyes to see with and a new heart to feel with and a new mind to understand with and a new will to embrace with the gospel of God. But in the narrower sense, and is this what we will be looking at this morning, in the narrower sense, Regeneration has in view the implantation of new life that then leads inevitably, now notice that word, inevitably, to conversion and further sanctification. And so we're going to focus on the narrower understanding, remembering that the narrower inevitably by its very nature leads to the broader. In other words, to anticipate no new life, no conversion. No new life, no regeneration. Because the seed of God comes not to live inertly within us, but to live transformatingly within us. So turn with me in your Bibles to perhaps one of the most familiar passages in the whole Bible, the third chapter of John's Gospel. I remember the first time I ever heard this passage read. It was on a wet Sunday afternoon in Glasgow. Most Sunday afternoons are wet in Glasgow, Robert, aren't they? November the 11th, 1966. I didn't possess a Bible, but I was invited along to a meeting. Read in with me from the closing words of the second chapter. Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people, and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now there was a man. Notice the juxtaposition. Notice how beautifully John tells us Jesus knew what was in a man. Now let me tell you about a man. A man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, 
How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. and You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Let me simply walk you through Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus. The first thing that John impresses upon us is that Nicodemus is a man with an impressive religious pedigree. He tells us that he was a man of the Pharisees. In verse 10, he says, You are the teacher of Israel. Hodadaskalos to Yisrael. You are the teacher. You are the Reverend Professor Dr. Nicodemus. He's a man who has a lineage of religious privilege. He had gospel privileges aplenty, and I use the language advisedly, he had gospel privileges aplenty. You remember how in Romans 9, Paul tells us about his own sorrow and anguish that his own people have um, turned from Christ and refused Christ, and he says, I could wish I myself were accursed and cut off for, from Christ for the sake of my brother, my kinsman, according to the flesh. They are Israelites. To them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. And to them belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. What astonishing God-given gospel privileges belonged to Nicodemus and to his covenant people. The adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. And right at the outset, John is flagging this up because he wants to show his readers and remember what the great purpose of the gospel of John is. John is not writing simply to inform us and educate us about Jesus. He's writing to win us to salvation in Jesus. These things are written, he says at the end of chapter 20. These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God. The Gospel of John is a 15,635-word gospel tract, at least in the Greek text it is. 15,635 words. And John's great concern is not simply to inform us and educate us and give us interesting insights into the person and work of a man called Jesus. John is out to grab us by the throat and to bring us in the power of the Spirit of God to bow down before the Son of God and embrace Him as Lord and Savior and King. And right at the outset, John is impressing on us that with all his religious privileges, with all his spiritual gospel privileges, Nicodemus was in the dark. He was outside of the communion of God. John wants his readers to understand that not one of their gospel privileges, nor all of them together, can make us right with God because by nature we are all children of wrath like the rest of mankind. 
You know, the gospel came with a cataclysm to the ancient world, but to the Jews in particular. We all, Ephesians 2, we all, like the rest of mankind, the Jew would be the very first to say the rest of mankind, by nature, children of God's wrath. And Paul says, we also, we also, with all our privileges, and Nicodemus needed to understand that sin was not a fungus to be scraped off. It was a deadly disease that required saving surgery. He needed to understand that the blood of goats and bulls could never deal effectively with sin. And it's this man who comes to Jesus by night and later on in the gospel, you remember how John tells us again about Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night? I think John is, is saying, do you get it? You know, we read the gospel so flatly. I think John is saying, you know why this man came at night? He was looking around. He didn't want anyone to know that he was en route to meet this itinerant rabbi who's teaching and whose mighty works were causing such a stir. He came under the cloak of darkness. Maybe some of you are, are here today under the cloak of being part of a, a larger body, and no one really notices that you have come and you're seeking to find a Savior. And then secondly, notice that John intriguingly says, Jesus answered him. Nicodemus hadn't asked a question. He came with a statement. He came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. He's not asking a question. But then John intriguingly says, Jesus answered him. Behind the statement, there was a question. And that's why John has told us at the end of chapter 2 that Jesus knew all people. He knew himself what was in man. Jesus saw behind the statement to the question. Jesus perceived in his holy pastoral humanity that here was a man who was making a statement, but he was really asking a question, are you really the Christ of God? Are you really the promised one? Are you the serpent crusher? Are you the one who is going to redeem us from our sins and bring the kingdom back to Israel? Are, are you the one? That's why when we speak with people, we should be praying all the time, Lord, give me the spiritual antennae to really know what people are about, to see behind the language, to the heart. People are rarely in initially willing to lay bare their heart. You have to gently probe with, yes, with a scalpel, but with a kindly hand wielding the scalpel. Jesus answered him, and Jesus is not impressed with Nicodemus's religious pedigree. And so it must have been startling to Nicodemus. We, we're intent, John is drawing us in to an encounter, to a dialogue, and is expecting us to try and understand the dynamic of the dialogue. Here he has come and he said, Rabbi, we, 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 we know that you're a teacher come from God because nobody could do the things you're doing unless God is with them. And Jesus cuts him off. He says, if you're not born again, you're going to hell. You'll never enter the kingdom of God. He's really saying to Nicodemus, you're an eminent man. Later on, as I said in verse 10, he will say, you are the teacher of Israel. He was the man. He was the R.C. Sproul of the Pharisees. 
He was the man, the, you know, hodidaskalos to Israel. He is the teacher. Reverend Dr. Professor Nicodemus. And it cuts nothing with the Savior. And he really says to Nicodemus, you're all wrong. Your problem is not that you need a refresher course from a rabbi. Your problem is not that there are some areas in your life and religion that need readjusted, refined, or corrected. Your problem is profounder than you could ever begin to imagine. You must be born again. I know then, from above, John's gospel, as I was saying, is full of double entendres, double meanings. I have a friend who wrote a doctorate at Cambridge on double entendres in, the John's, gospel, in John's gospel, over a hundred of them, embedded into the texture of the uh, inspired scripture that the Holy Spirit uses John to pen. Your problem is deeper and profounder. You must be born again. And then thirdly, notice how Jesus highlights Nicodemus's spiritual blindness. Nicodemus asks him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus is all at sea. He, he's failing completely to understand the spiritual truth embedded in Jesus' words. Now think what Jesus is saying to this deeply spiritual teacher who belonged to the covenant people of God with all their gospel privileges. He's saying simply this to him, do you not get it, Nicodemus? Have you never understood, though you be a rabbi and schooled in rabbinic teaching, and though quite possibly, as there were many rabbis, many, well, maybe that's putting it too strongly, there were quite a number of rabbis who had memorized the whole of what we call the Old Testament. They could stand up. They could stand up and they could say, in the beginning, Bereshit bara Elohim, ba'et shamayim ha'aret. They could just go through the whole scriptures. And Jesus is saying to him, you know nothing because you don't know the first necessary truth of biblical religion. You see, Jesus wasn't teaching new doctrine, was he? Remember how back in Deuteronomy, um, God patiently impresses on his people that what they need is a circumcised heart. Twice, isn't it, in um, Deuteronomy 10 and again in, in chapter 30, I think, he says, you need your heart. Do you not understand you people? Do you think you're God? is content with outward observances and religious practices, albeit punctilious and according to the letter of the law. God looks on the heart. Circumcise your hearts. By Psalm 51, David comes and he says, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. All those really great, great words that we should all know very, very well and in Isaiah 66, isn't it? This is the one to whom I will look, says the Lord, who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. And one of the dangers in Reformed Christianity is that we can, we can be content with knowing ourselves and knowing others who know the great doctrines of the gospel. My dear, dear friends, it's not enough to know the great doctrines of the gospel. We need to know the God of the great doctrines of the gospel. Amen. We need to know the power of the truth 
in our lives. We need to not simply be walking, talking, evangelical Christians. We need to be lovers of Christ. We need to know the expulsive power of a new affection, to quote Thomas Chalmers. We need to know truth residing in our hearts, not merely to give us intellectual credibility, but truth captivating our souls so that we can sing, Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. And it's at this point in the encounter that Jesus confronts Nicodemus with the ABC of biblical religion. And he says to him, after Nicodemus has asked, how can I be born when I'm old and enter a second time into my mother's womb? Jesus says, unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Jesus is saying simply this to Nicodemus, no matter how hard you may try, all you'll be able to produce is more of the same. All religion can do is produce more religion. Devoted religion, uh, precise religion, even reformed religion. but only religion. Jesus has told Nicodemus he needs a new heart. And this is what the imagery of water and spirit is signifying to him. He's using language. He's using imagery that goes back to Ezekiel 36. Water purifies, it washes clean, the spirit renovates. And these are the two twin elements in regeneration, purification and renovation. That's why the born again live a new life. The Spirit comes not only to purify, but to renovate. And Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, this is what you need to understand, Nicodemus. You cannot give yourself a new heart. You need to face up to this. You are utterly unable, utterly unable to do what needs to be done. If you're to enter the kingdom of God, you'll never do it under your own steam, by your own efforts, by your punctilious religious observances, by your keeping of the law. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. All it can do is produce more of the same. Now, this may seem a counsel of despair. Somebody comes to you and says, I want to be saved. You say to them, oh, what a great thing to desire. Let me tell you this, you can't save yourself. Good night. Well, they can't save themselves. Is Jesus simply giving Nicodemus a counsel of despair? Does Jesus now leave Nicodemus to go home and wait till the Spirit sovereignly moves and grants him a new heart, takes away his heart of stone, gives him a heart of flesh? What has Jesus been doing here? He's been deliberately distressing Nicodemus, distressing him. This man with all his privileges... This man knew the Bible inside out. This man would probably put us to shame. And Jesus is distressing him. He's saying, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. You see, until you know your hopelessness and your helplessness, the gospel of Jesus Christ will never be sweet to your taste, or sweet to your hearing. That was my experience. I had 
and I knew nothing of the Bible, didn't possess a Bible, wasn't raised in a church going home. I knew one thing in the Bible, David's lament over Saul and Mount Gilboa. I'd, I'd, I'd memorized it at the age of 11 because my primary school teacher said it was a good bit of literature. And so I memorized it, tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ascot. I didn't know John 3.16. I didn't know Jesus Christ came into the world to seek and to save the lost. And when a friend, a boy I got to know older than me at school, I was almost finished my high school, uh, my, my weekends were spent clubbing. I, you wouldn't call it that, we just called it, what do we call it? Going to the dancing. Um, he said, come along. And the fellow leading this young adult Bible class was told there are two unconverted boys here today, and he scrapped his talk and preached in John 3.16. God distressed me. He distressed me by lifting up Jesus Christ before me. Thomas Goodwin said, if you would know what sin is, go to Mount Calvary. That's what this preacher did. He lifted up Jesus Christ, and for the first time in my life, I not only knew I was a sinner, I felt I was a sinner before a holy God. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He's really distressing Nicodemus to the hopeful point where Nicodemus would cry out to God, give me what I cannot give myself. But having distressed him, notice that Jesus then holds out hope to Nicodemus. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. He's saying to Nicodemus, you cannot make yourself to be born again, to be made anew, but the Spirit of God can. The Holy Spirit can give you what you could never give yourself. Jesus is saying to this deeply religious man, cast yourself on the grace and mercy of God. And he uses, doesn't he, this simple but vivid illustration to impress his teaching on Nicodemus. He says the the spirit blows where it wishes, where it wills, You hear its sound, you don't know where it comes from or where it goes, so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. It's it's a beautiful point, isn't it, Jesus is making? He's really making two points to Nicodemus. You need the wind of God, the pneuma of God, the Spirit of God to do for you what you can't do for yourself. And here's the thing, Nicodemus, the work of the Spirit of God is sovereign and mysterious. You know, every Christian has the same testimony. The incidentals are really incidentals. We, we all have the same testimony. Born from above by the sovereign work of God. Chosen not for me, wakened up from wrath to flee. I sometimes think in evangelical Christianity, we've been far too taken up with testimonies. You know, testimonies were unheard of, relatively, prior to the early decades of the 19th century. Don't misunderstand me. Please don't misunderstand me. It's wonderful how the Lord brings us by a myriad of roots to cast ourselves upon the Savior, how He regenerates us sovereignly uh, in the strangest of circumstances. I knew of a man who was leaping over a wall, and before he began to leap over the wall, he was an unbeliever, and when he leapt over the wall on the other side, he was a born-again Christian. The Spirit blows where He wills. God breaks all the conventions of humanity. He doesn't conform to our petty little conformable structures of thought. He does what he does. Let God be God. He's saying to Nicodemus, you can't predict the work of God. 
You cannot see God at work. He works mysteriously, sovereignly, but you can see the effects of his work. The wind blows where it will, and you see the effects of it. In other words, when the Spirit comes and sovereignly and mysteriously gives us new life, and we wonder, what's happened to me? Things I, I once longed after, I, I'm beginning to lose taste for, and things I once had no time for, I, I now have an appetite for. I remember shortly after I was converted, uh, don't get me wrong about I'm anti-dancing, anti-everything, I went with some friends at school to a large dance hall in Glasgow, and I remember yet the Locarno, bottom of Sucky Hall Street, Robert, paid eight shillings and threepence to get in. I still remember it. Got, got my ticket. And my friend said, we're off to the restroom. Well, they didn't call it a restroom. We called it something else. <laughs> um, and I remember standing there, and there would be about 2,000 people in this big dance hall. And I remember looking at the ticket and thinking, what am I doing here? I don't want to be here. I left. On Monday at school, my friend said, what happened to you? I said, I don't belong there any longer. God in his goodness had begun to give me a taste for something better and a distaste, not for dancing per se, I, I don't mean that, but a distaste for what this world had to offer me. You cannot hide the new birth. Just like you can't hide physical life, you can't hide spiritual life. By their fruits, you will know them. The absolute necessity of the new birth rests on two truths, doesn't it? I'll close with this. The first is this. There is a city bright closed at its gates to sin. If we are ever to be in the nearer presence of God, we need to be made new. Not just given a refresher course, not just given a new paint job, we need to be made new from the inside out. And the second great truth, of course, is our complete inability to give ourselves what we need to be right with God and to be in the presence of God. We must be made new, but we're helpless to make ourselves new. And that's why the gospel of Jesus Christ is gospel, glad tidings. Glad tidings. Go to every man and woman and tell them, God has given to this world a Savior. Look to Him. Look to Him and be saved. How can I be saved? I don't have faith. I don't have repentance. Go to God. Give me what I do not have. Give me what I do not have. And the Holy Spirit comes, sent from the Father and the Son, to bring life secured and won by Jesus Christ, because the life that He comes with is the life of God. It's the seed of God. So let me just make four brief points of application. Number one, Regeneration is a sovereign work of God. We are completely passive. We are dead until He makes us alive. And until we are made alive, we can neither repent or be converted. Secondly, regeneration ensures that all the praise and the glory alone belong to God. We've got nothing to contribute. Nothing in my hands I bring. We contribute nothing to our physical birth we contribute nothing to our spiritual birth. Number four, 
regen number three, regeneration inevitably issues in new life. No new life, no Holy Spirit. No new life. I don't mean there won't be struggle. I think one of the marks, one of the authentic marks of the new birth is to see someone struggling with sin. Romans 7. If you don't struggle with sin, I can hardly think there is new life within you. The spirit wages war against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit. Sometimes in this new life there is turmoil, but there is always this, Lord, to whom else can I go? And then finally, the purpose of regeneration is to make us spiritual people, to make us people of the Spirit, those who live and walk by the Spirit. And what is, what does it mean to walk by the Spirit? It means to live to the glory of Jesus Christ. So, the Holy Spirit and regeneration, Christianity 101, I'm, I'm very conscious of that. I've said nothing that probably almost all of you didn't know. But if you're anything like me, we need constantly be to reminded and brought back to the very fountainhead of the gospel that the God who could righteously and with eternal blessedness cast us into a lost eternity in love set himself upon a people to make his own. He sent his son to ensure that that would come to pass, and together they send the Holy Spirit to bring it to pass. So all the praise is his. So may the Lord bless to us his word this morning. Amen.